If you could turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 14. It's a longer passage. Um, I'm not going to be commenting on every single verse in this passage, so you will get home for lunch. Um, <clears throat> but it, sometimes it's good to see things in context, plus the fact that verses 3 through 14 in the original Greek are only two sentences. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to stop. <laughs> but let's uh, follow along as I read. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who has also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we have heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Wow, that is a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> Over the past few months, we have been looking at the mission of Jesus and how we are partners in that mission uh, with him. And uh, that we are called, we are actually commissioned by Jesus um, in a great commission that was given in Matthew 28. We looked at that a few weeks ago. It's a, it's a calling. It is a purpose, a life goal, if you will. It's, it's not just simply a tax that we put on our to-do list, but rather it is a co-mission. Co meaning with, mission is something that God's called us to. We have been invited to join with Jesus in his mission of sharing the good news that God has come to redeem his people, to, 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 to literally pay uh, for the penalty of our sin for anyone who would come to him, anyone who would be willing to open their heart and, and, and seek an understanding of who God is. Jesus in Matthew 28, these were the final words he spoke before he ascended into heaven. And, and he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In other words, the crucified Christ who is raised from the dead now stands 40 days later ready to literally ascend into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father, the place of authority and power. And he says, all authority has been given to me. And he says, therefore... I'm sending you. We go in his authority. He said, therefore, go and make disciples. That's the commission. Go and make disciples. We look at that word and, and you know, oftentimes you look at that and you say, well, go, that's a verb. No, it's not. The command isn't to go. The command is to make disciples. The word is a participle in the Greek, which means as you go or in all your goings, 
your comings and your goings in your everyday life, make disciples. So as you go, that's the mission, as you go in every aspect of your life, through your every, the part of your everyday normal life, we are called to make disciples. Well, how do I do that? Do I have to quit my job? Do I have to become full-time? This is crazy. How can we do that? I've got things to do. Well, let me talk about what it means to be involved in the as-you-go mission of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, in our everyday life, we wear many hats, don't we? We have roles. You know, we are a parent, right, or a grandparent, we are a spouse, a husband, or a wife. We are a brother or a sister within our family. We are co-workers. We have bosses. We are in charge of people. We have all these different hats and roles that we wear. Making disciples is not something that we do. It's something that we are. It is a role that we've been called to by Jesus Christ. When you go to work, Gabriel, when you go to work, do you cease being a father? When you go to work, do you cease being a father? No, you're still a father, right? Yeah. He's looking at me like, wait, what are you saying? What are you saying? <laughs> so, Abby, when you go to school and become a student, do you cease being a daughter? Right? You don't. They say, who's your parents? I don't know. I'm a student. Yeah, when we go to work, we don't cease the other roles that we have. We are. We don't just simply be a parent when our kids are around. We're a parent all the time. We don't simply be a spouse when our spouse is around. We are a husband or a wife, whether our spouse is here or not. Because if not, then we've got problems. Um, and. Um, right. <laughs> And so these roles become identities for us. They are part of who we are. And of course, we have our personalities. Um, we are more than our job title, obviously. But, you know, we are a landscaper, we are a painter, we are a teacher. You know, we have these things that we are. And when we go into another phase during our day, we don't cease to be that person. We carry it with us. And the same thing is true with being a follower of Jesus Christ. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you are his disciple. A disciple is someone who is devoted to Jesus, loves Jesus, has been forgiven, has been, has, has been reconciled to the Father through the Son. Someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ, and a follower is someone, we've said, who wants to be like their master. Everything that I do, I want to emulate Jesus. I want to imitate Christ. Why? Because he is my all in all. And so as a disciple, we are a follower of Jesus. Now, do we, are we only a follower of Jesus when we go to church on Sundays? Or let's be, let's be magnanimous, magnanimous. How do I say that word? Magnanimous, thank you. Let's be magnanimous and say, I'm going to do it all day on Sunday. I'm a follower of Jesus on Sunday, but when Monday comes around, business is business. No, we don't do that. When Monday comes around, we're still a follower of Jesus Christ. We're still a parent. We're still a spouse, a husband or a wife. You know, that's who we are. Are you with me? And if we see that, that we carry the, the identity of our role as a disciple into every aspect of our lives, then being on mission means that we are a follower of Jesus Christ when we go to work. We're a follower of Jesus Christ when we walk in our neighborhood and we talk to our neighbor across the fence. We're a follower of Jesus Christ when we're parents at home. We're a follower of Jesus Christ in everything that we do. Being on mission is not something that we schedule. It's like, oh, got to make disciples. Oh, let me look at my schedule. Hey, I got some freedom Wednesday morning, 6 to 7. We can do that then. Oh, Tuesday night. Tuesday night, that's my disciple night. No, we don't do that. It's something that we do as we go about our everyday life. That's what Jesus was talking about when he says, as you go, 
make disciples. It's not a task that we put on our to-do list. Oh, got to make disciples. Who am I going to hone in on? Abby. Ha, she's the one. <laughs> no. We get to be an influence to everyone we meet. It is not life plus mission, but life on mission. Big difference. Let me ask you this question. When Jesus in his three years of ministry, was he ever off the clock? Think about that. Was he ever off the clock? Was there every time where he says, yeah, I'm not Messiah for a The next hour, I'm, I'm taking a break. I'm not Messiah. <laughs> for the next hour, I'm not discipling you guys. No. He lived with them. They lived with him. You know, it wasn't necessarily 24-7, three years straight, but they had times together, and they had times with their family, and their family sometimes came with them, and, and it is a, a whole lot uh, more integrated than we think. Um, and I love the film, The Chosen, the, the seasons that they're doing, because they, they, they kind of give that sense of, of their sharing life together. And as they share life, Jesus is teaching them through life's situations and, and, and illustrations from everyday life. And they're learning what it means to know God. That's discipleship. And Jesus was never, he, there was never a time where he ceased to be the Messiah. No, he was always the Messiah. And when we come to Jesus and receive his forgiveness and yield our lives to him as Lord, we become his disciples. And as a disciple of Jesus, we're called to an as-you-go mission. So I want to look at Colossians chapter 1, first 14 verses. Actually, we're just going to look at a couple of verses in there. But I want you to get a sense of what Paul is saying as he's writing to this church at Colossae. Um, he opens with thanksgiving and prayer, which is the scripture reading we read. Paul usually opens letters that he writes. First of all, he is thankful for who they are. He points out the things that they are doing well in the Lord. Now, if he's got issues to deal with them, he still points out that, that he, you are a blessing to me because of this, 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 and this. And then he prays. And his prayers, we can copy his prayers and pray them for other people. But he always opens with thanksgiving and prayer and and, and in this passage, he rejoices in their faith and their hope and their love that comes from hearing and receiving the gospel. That's what he says in verse 5. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored for you in heaven that you have already heard about in the word of truth, which is the gospel that has come to you. And then he makes this statement. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit. Now, for Paul, the world that he knew was the Mediterranean area. And at this point, the gospel had spread. Uh, the disciples had taken it to India. They had taken it as far as Spain. Some think that, the, that England was even reached in the, in the first generation of the church. And Paul's saying, all over the world, this gospel, this good news of Jesus is bearing fruit. But then he says, and it's doing so among you. It's huge, but it's here. And he says, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit, but among you as well. How does the gospel bear fruit? You say, yeah, that's great. Gospel's bearing fruit. How does the gospel bear fruit? How does the message of Jesus' death and resurrection and why he came bear fruit? Bears fruit when people hear it and respond. Right? And they become Christians, followers of Jesus. It bears fruit externally as people respond and come to Christ. It bears fruit in us internally as we understand the implications of that gospel upon our lives that we're called to follow Jesus. And it bears fruit because it is spreading all over the world. How did the gospel spread in Paul's day? What do you think? Did they have a marketing campaign? What was that? Word of mouth, exactly. They didn't have a marketing campaign. They didn't do an email boost. There was no magazines, Christian magazines, where you could advertise. There were no billboards. 
They didn't do things like that. That is our culture in the past 50 years, probably 60 years. There was no marketing. Jesus' marketing strategy was this. Go tell someone. And have them tell someone. And have them tell someone. And in the telling, influence people so that they would be willing to live their lives for the glory of God. That's making disciples. And, and Paul says that it was by word of mouth. He went places and talked to people and, and shared the good news. In fact, he did not start the church in Colossae. He's the apostle over that church because he led someone named Epaphras to the Lord in Ephesus. Epaphras got saved as he listened to Paul and talked to Paul and, 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 and understood God's grace and the gospel of Jesus. And he says, I'm going home and sharing it with my family. And he went to Colossae and he started to share it with his family and his friends. And out of that, a church started. And because Paul led Epaphras to the Lord, Paul saw that Epaphras, is, the fruit of Epaphras' ministry was something that he could exercise encouragement and oversight over. And so the letter to the church at Colossae. But he says in verse 7, you learned it from Epaphras, <coughs> our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister on, of Christ on our behalf, and also told us of your love and the spirit. So Epaphras went to Colossae, and, and here's a guy who just came to an understanding of Jesus, and he begins to share it in his hometown. And people go, wow, I didn't know that. And God opens up hearts and people say, well, how can we follow Jesus? And he starts to share whatever it is he's known. He didn't probably know a whole lot, but whatever he knew, he shared. And church started. So it was by word of mouth. Do you know that that is the strategy today? That great marketing campaigns don't yield much. They don't get much bang for the buck. In fact, I remember years ago attending a, um, a training session for Billy Graham, you know, evangelistic crusades. And, and they said that uh, almost 90% of the people who come to Christ come to Christ because they were brought there by a close friend. It's relational. And, and Billy Graham was able to communicate the gospel so that their close friends could hear and understand the good news. And they saw the testimony in their friend's life and were willing to say, I'll give my life to Jesus. We don't need to have a big crusade for that to happen. It can happen this week in your life. And maybe you've been planting the seed for years. That's okay. Because sometimes it takes years for God to bring a person to a place of understanding. And and that's what Epaphras did in Colossae. The good news bears fruit today in the same people, the same way. As people go about their everyday lives being an influence for Jesus Christ, living open and, and um, you know, large lives for Jesus, be willing to say thank God for what he's done and, and rejoice and just openly being a Christian where you are. That's the influence that we have. You see, making disciples is more than just getting someone to pray a prayer. It's influencing the lives so that they are willing, whether it's incrementally or, or whether it is you know, all at once to say, I, I, I want to move toward Christ. And disciple making starts before someone makes a faith commitment. It's the conversations we have. It's living our lives in such a way that other people see the glory of Jesus in us. You know, the gospel can bear fruit in the same way that a little acorn becomes an oak tree. It could take years, and that's okay. Paul goes on in verse 9. Um, he says, for this reason, since the day we've heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every good, in every way or in every good work. 
Paul's prayer for them is that they would live their lives in a way that brought glory to God, worthy of the Lord. That's a wonderful prayer for us to pray for one another, right? Asking God to fill us with a knowledge of his will. Um, that we would have all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that we would be able to see beyond just the surface things. Um, to know who we are to share with, to know who it is that God may be uh, placing in our pathways that we can influence, being willing to be intentional about uh, how can we help someone else understand who Jesus is. Maybe praying for them if they have a need, maybe sharing something, maybe asking him a question that opens up a conversation. And Paul says that, uh, that he prayed that so that our lives may please the Lord in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. Well, what's a good work? It's influencing a life for somebody else. Like we said last week, it's, we're blessed to be a blessing, that we can share a blessing in word, action, or gift. What is that? It opens the door for the gospel. It says this is a tangible means by which we can demonstrate God's love and our love for you. So I want you to think. It is 20 after 11 right now. We're almost done. This time tomorrow, where are you going to be? Where are you going to be? It could be at work. Be at work. We're going to be at different places. We're going to be with different people. You will have your greatest mission opportunity this time tomorrow. And this time on Tuesday and this time on Wednesday throughout the week. As you live your life, live it for the glory of God. Be willing be willing to open conversations as the door opens. Be willing to let people know that you love Jesus and that he is your Lord. And watch what happens. Our lives are an influence for Jesus. In verses uh, 10 and 11 that I read, it says that we are to bear fruit in every good work growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened in all power according to his glorious might, so that we might have great endurance, patience, and joy. That is God's goal for us. You know, we sang a song about, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's part of the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on, on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what does that mean? What portion of the earth are you praying for? Where you are. So why don't you think about this time tomorrow. Think about, Lord, let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here. Wherever here is, whatever town or village or place you're at, Lord, let your will be done here. Let the influence of your kingdom come here. That's as we go mission. The faith, the hope, and the love that Paul talked about in the beginning part of the Thanksgiving is really balanced by the endurance, the patience, and the joy at the end. That as we go about living our life for Jesus, Yes, we need faith, we need hope, we need love. We need to walk in those attitudes, but we also need endurance. We need patience, and we need joy. We get to share it. So here's the thing. We get to live our lives in a commission with Jesus Christ. He's walking with us. He's filling us with his spirit. We get to talk to other people about the thing that can radically change their lives. Of course, the enemy is going to come and say, not here. Yeah, just that's paper thin. Push through it. And say, I can talk to people about Jesus. What happens if they get mad? Well, it's okay. If they get mad, stop talking about Jesus. <laughs> Pray for them. Chances are they aren't. If you come with an open heart and an open hand, that they will be willing to hear. 
So as you go, influence everyone you come in contact with with the presence of Jesus. Let your prayer be, Lord, help them to want to know who Jesus is so that they can experience the joy that I'm experiencing. Let the gospel bear fruit in your life so that you can live a life worthy of the Lord. And as you go, make disciples. Amen? So there's a lot of blanks that need to be filled in. That's where you need the wisdom of the Lord and you need to ask him, how do you want me to do this practically? But I want to encourage you. Um, you're on mission every moment of your life. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have called us to be a part of your great plan in history. And Lord, though we may play small parts here and there, Lord, cumulatively, Lord, we know that there is a victory that you have won through the cross and that you are working that out in the world today. Thank you, Lord, for what we heard about in Malawi. And Lord, people coming to know Jesus. We ask, Lord, that that would happen here as well. Lord, inspire us, equip us, fill us, strengthen us, that we might be your disciples and that we might be able to influence someone as they decide to follow Jesus. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.